triumph and disaster through our intelligence service, we learnt of the Royal Air Force's gigantic preparations for the destruction of the German armament centres and large cities. The aim of this air offensive was obvious. Germany was to be beaten to a pulp on the home front. In a long-term offensive which, according to Churchill's words, would cost England blood, sweat and tears, the German key points and industry were to be systematically wiped out and a death blow dealt to the German cities and population. From now onwards, the war was to be waged against women, children and civilians. The hatred among the nations now seemed to know no bounds. Belief in God and justice was shaken and mankind had become diabolical. All over Great Britain, huge airfields were built as takeoff bases for the bomber squadrons. The aircraft industry worked day and night on the new four engine bombers, short Stirlings, Lancasters, and Halifaxes, which could carry up to 10 tons of bombs over Germany. The British air staff produced a comprehensive plan for a series of night attacks on the German cities worked out to the day, the hour, and the minute. But the defence was not asleep. New night fighter wings came into being overnight. A barrage of night fighter and flak sectors stretched from France across Belgium, Holland and Germany, right up to Denmark. Our Schleswig base was one link in this long chain. After 29 night missions, I was an old hand at the game. I had grown to be part and parcel of my machine, and night after night my self-confidence increased. So far, those who had been shot down were mainly young, inexperienced night fighters who had been too busy flying their machines. Luckily for me, my first 29 missions were completed without any contact with the enemy. Nor had my squadron had very much success apart from a few day and night victories. We lived a carefree existence during the day, enjoying this respite, until one grey November day in 1941, our CO, Hauptmann Streib, appeared in the ops room after a fine blind landing and told us that the squadron had been posted to Venlo. This news was a pleasant surprise for me, for Venlo was not far away from my hometown of Homburg. The ground staff and the girls of Schleswig, however, were not so pleased, and there were quite a few tears at our departure. In a low flight over the town, no three squadron of night, fighter wing, no one, Nacht Jagdgeschwader, NJG1, said farewell to their airfield. Venlo lies on the Dutch-German frontier not far from the Ruhr. The Dutch population was correct but anti-German and as a result we rarely left our base. At Christmas 1941, I went on leave to Homburg. The morale of the people was good despite the constant air raid warnings and the perpetual blackout. Everyone believed sincerely in final victory. Thanks to the heavy ground defences, destruction in the Ruhr had been insignificant. So far, night fighters had not been used over the Ruhr because of the danger of being shot down by their own flak. The civilians pitied the British bomber crews who were shot down. How could the Royal Air Force send their boys so irresponsibly to their certain death? Everyone hoped that peace would not be long delayed for one special announcement followed the other. On 26 March 1942, at twenty or so hours in the briefing room of our night fighter group at Venlo, we listened to the Met. Then the CO gave the wave detail for the night. We had forty aircraft at Venlo. The wing was fully aware of its tradition as the first night fighter wing in Germany. Many victories in the air had already been won, and the CO himself had the highest score. It is not surprising that he was admired by all the men under his command. The crews were close-pressed in the ops room, listening to the final briefing. The listening posts on the Channel Coast have announced the preparation of a large raid by the British bomber formations. The weather is favourable to the defence. Presumably the enemy will choose the Ruhr as the nearest objective in order to avoid unnecessary losses. After the first wave is airborne, the second will be in immediate readiness. The third wave remains in a state of alert. We are flying over the Ruhr today for the first time. The flak has been notified and will limit its fire to 15,000 feet. The searchlight beams above 15,000 feet will be our arena. It is essential to observe a minimum altitude of 15,000 feet, for the flak cannot guarantee the safety of the night fighter aircraft below this. There was a buzz among the crews. Well, let's hope we're lucky.
Should the flak fire above 15,000 feet despite their orders, the CO went on, the night fighters concerned will fire distress and recognition flares. Incidentally, we are in constant telephonic communication with the flak divisional commander on the Wolfsburg in Duisburg. The crews for the Ruhr mission will be notified later. The crews did not look too happy at this news. The witch's cauldron over the Ruhr was well known an unbroken sea of searchlights with thousands of flak guns. When all their guns were in action, even we pitied the poor Tommies who had to fly their heavy unwieldy crates through this fiery holocaust. The British crews frequently jettisoned their bombs before reaching the objective and turned for home, and now we were to fight over this inferno of flak bursts, even if the gunners observed their limit of 15,000. In this respect, we had very little confidence in the gunners. And now the officer of the day gave the final briefing. Operation Ruhr. First wave, Lieutenant Jonin. Second wave, Feldwebel Lauer. The crews are to get in touch immediately with the flak liaison officer and discuss with him the tactics of the operation. Until the alert signal is given the film quacks, the crash pilot will be shown in the mess together with German weekly newsreel. Obviously, they were trying to take our minds off things, and this was all to the good, for no one felt particularly happy. My faithful radio operator, Resop, in the best of form as usual, fetched his navigation briefcase and spread the map out before me. Feldwebel Lauer's crew joined us. We were completely indifferent to Quax, the crash pilot, and it seemed more intelligent to work out our tactical preparations. In a few brief words, the flak liaison officer gave us the outlines of the operation. We had to fly from Venlo on a northeasterly course over a beacon near Vezel. This beacon would give the intermittent signs AF and report our arrival to the Wolfsburg. Our combat altitude of 17,000 feet had to be reached above this beacon. From this position we were to change over to a certain signal and be led by the flak apparatus over the target. In this way, the flak on each side of our position would recognise us and be able to get a bomber in the searchlights for us to shoot down. The flak would cease firing as soon as we were engaged. Good. In theory, that's all very simple and clear, but in the heat of a scrap, I replied to my mates of the ground defence. Rissop advised me to see that my parachute fitted well. Parachutes, in actual fact, were often exchanged or newly packed without anyone paying much attention to the size and yet how important it was for the belt to fit close to the body. At a bailing-out speed of more than 300 miles per hour, the opening jerk of the parachute brought into play great stresses which could have disastrous results if the belt were loose. Above all, the belly was in great danger in the case of loose thigh straps, and many a pilot had cause to regret his irresponsibility in this respect. Our old parachute sergeant, Frobos, was soon on the spot and saw that our belts fitted. Is something special on, Herr Lieutenant? he asked genially, as he gave a final look at my life belt. No, Frobos, we only want to avoid being dispatched into the next world. Frobos gave a knowing laugh. Well, good hunting, he said, and if the parachute doesn't open when you bail out, then come and get a new one from me tomorrow morning. Once our preparations were finished, we felt in the right mood to be cheered up by the antics of Quax, the pilot who committed all the faults in the calendar. There was great excitement in the theatre. The crews sat there smoking at their ease in the mess armchairs and did not spare their comments. The fighter controller, Ober Lieutenant Hitgen, was their special butt. We were all bent double with laughing and had soon forgotten our Ruhr operation as we enjoyed the misfortunes of poor Quax on the screen. In the middle of the film, the officer of the day put his head through the door and gave the order. First wave at readiness. Quacks. The crash pilot was immediately turned off and the crews got into the bus, which was to take them over to their machines. Heaven be praised. In Venlo we needed no my wests or dinghies. The chief mechanic told me that my crate, Fritz Ludwig, was airworthy and helped me fasten my parachute. The engines were ready for a cold start. That meant one had to be particularly careful. 
A certain amount of petrol is mixed with crude oil causing considerable lubrication when the engine started and thus doing away with the need for warming up. But an immediate takeoff was necessary, for after five minutes the petrol evaporated from the actual heat of the engines. Then came the critical moment when the oil had not yet reached sufficiently high temperature and the petrol had already evaporated. This critical moment must not be allowed to occur at the greatest moment of engine strain and therefore, above all, not at the start, because as a result of insufficient lubrication, the pistons would become worn and the machine would inevitably be a write-off. Watching your instruments on a cold start is particularly important. At normal running speed, that is at cruising speed, the critical moment does not damage the engine. Rysop and I were all set to take off and had put on our oxygen masks in readiness for our 17,000 feet ceiling. Above 13,000 feet on a steep climb, a man can no longer live without oxygen, and from this altitude the physical reactions and quick thinking are impaired. At a height of 17,000 feet, two minutes without oxygen means certain death. We had already put on our masks for the simple reason that putting them on in the air is always troublesome. Now we had plenty of time to make our preparations. My comrades were also sitting in their machines, and occasionally I saw the flash of a torch, overhead a magnificent starry sky. Papa Hitgen, in his role as fighter controller, broadcast a lesson in astronomy with a pithy commentary. He knew how to keep the crews in a good mood and to banish the nervous tension of waiting. Even after the orders to take off had been given, he would say farewell to the crews with the record. Come back, I'm waiting for you. That night he had to wait a long time for me. As my pals told me later, he never gave up hope that I should return and did everything in his power to help me find the airfield until finally he learnt that I had been shot down. All his arts were then, of course, in vain. The Britishers were taking their time. The hand of my instrument panel clock stood at 21.30 hours. I suddenly felt like telephoning my parents. Venlo was in direct communication with Duisburg, and from there I could easily get the connection. This was, of course, strictly forbidden, but at this decisive moment I did not want to miss the opportunity. I sprang out of my aircraft and ran to the headquarter truck. Papa Hitgen, who from this point was in control of operations, looked dumbfounded when he saw me turn up. Have you gone off your nut, John N? he demanded. Suppose the CO finds out. What are you doing here? Have you got stage fright or something? Doctor Seeker, he called out to the station quack, who was also in readiness. Give Yonan a bromide. I let him go on talking and already had the Wolfsburg on the line. There was a crackle in the receiver. My parents answered. Hitgen stared at me as though I had fallen out of the clouds, but before he could open his mouth I was running back to my machine. The clock hand showed 21.45 hours when Hitgen dispatched the first wave for the ops over Holland. The British bomber stream had assembled east of London over the Thames estuary and was now flying on a direct course for the Ruhr. Position of the bomber stream was west of Flushing on Walcheren. My comrades took off at short intervals. Each time the engines roared, a trail of sparks rained down on the flare path. The dark shadows swiftly disappeared on the horizon and set Corsi for their beacons. 21 by 55 hours. At a great height I could hear the singing drone of a fast English machine. Presumably it was the pathfinder. In the distance I could hear the sirens wailing. 22. Oh wow, it's yours. Still no orders for me to take off. I gradually grew both impatient and nervous. Finally, at 22, oh two hours, Lieutenant John in take off. The inertia starters roared, the blades turned clumsily, and soon both engines were running. Good hunting, my mechanic shouted into the cockpit as he closed the roof. I pushed the speed lock forward and taxied to the starting point. 22.03 hours airborne. A bare twenty minutes later, I reached the scheduled height of 17,000 feet and circled above my beacon west of Wessel. The sky towered majestically above me and the stars seemed to be closer, so wonderfully bright was the night. It was a serene and peaceful sight at this high altitude, 
Up there man feels the vastness of the cosmos and his own insignificance. The earth was far away. My fellow men down there were far away, and yet it was my duty to preserve them from direct catastrophe. How dark it was below. Here and there I could see the blood-red glow of the blast furnaces, which, now that the enemy was approaching, would be extinguished. A few searchlights suddenly went on and began their play in the sky, as though trying to warn the approaching bombers. Lights went on only to go out immediately. Even at that altitude I could feel the nervous haste of the men below in face of the threatening disaster. From south to north in a broad sweep glittered a smooth grey ribbon, the Rhine, the first landmark for the British. The earth seemed to have sunk into itself before the deadly danger from the air, as though it would soon give a mighty scream of fear and despair at its tormentors. The first flares fell and flooded the landscape with a ghostly light. The British were looking for their target, and now fell the parachute flares which opened at one five hundred feet and swayed slowly down to the ground. A hurricane burst upon the Tommies. Hundreds of searchlights went on, pointing their thin fingers at the enemy bombers. Thousands of flak salvos flashed, forming a box barrage round the Ruhr. The British master of ceremonies, however, proceeded imperturbably on his way, dropping his markers, the so-called Christmas trees. The parachute flares were still hanging like bunches of grapes over the landscape. According to my observations, Duisburg was probably being attacked. The ground station reported my pal's first successes over Holland, Two victories for my CO, Hauptmann Steib, within eight minutes. In the meantime, the master of ceremonies had found his target. He strewed the sky with red, green and white flares, which really looked like Christmas trees, and with their harsh lights illuminated the objective the harbour installations of duisburg Ruhrort. His work was done and now hell was let loose. The flak kept up a continuous drum fire on the approaching bombers, the shells burst and crackled between 1200 and 1500 feet. The Tommies were flying in fan formation at graded heights in order to divert the defence. Pitilessly, the leading enemy machines were caught in the searchlight beams. Their silver bodies glittered like bright fishes against the dark night sky. The flak would not let its prey out of its claws. The fate of the bomber was sealed. In a matter of seconds, Flight direction, speed and altitude were worked out on the flak gunner's instruments and, hit by the next salvo, the bomber crashed with its load into the depths. Three, four and five British machinis were burning in the air. And they fell like comets earthwards. I was completely engrossed by this grandiose performance and was really startled when the ground station suddenly called Buzzard 10 from Eagle. Give your fighter recognition signal. Course 130. Keep your prescribed altitude. 80 enemy aircraft over Duisburg. We're handing you over to Wolfsburg. Message ended. That's all. I checked my engines and navigating lights. Everything in order. Rissop called up Wolfsburg. Wolfsburg from Buzzard 10. Come in, please. The fighter controller reported immediately and gave me orders to attack any machine caught in the searchlight beams above 15,000 feet. I set my course straight for the witch's cauldron. The nearer I approached target, the brighter it grew around me. A sea of light from the bright searchlights blinded me each time I made the slightest attempt to look down below. The flak shells crumped, some of them far above me, and I felt that I was now flying through hell. The first explosion made my machine quiver as a shell burst fifty yards ahead of me. The next moment the blast seized my Messerschmitt 110 as with a giant's fist and shook it. Get busy, Rissop, I shouted. Fire the recognition signals. The next one will get us. But already two green and one white flare had burst in the sky. Are those bloody idiots trying to shoot us down? roared Rissop, reloading his flare pistol. Instinctively I had put the machine into a steep left-hand turn. The next salvo burst beside us. We're not going to make it as easy for you as that, I thought. Ahead of me, a cluster of searchlights were lighting up the sky. Hesitantly, the white beams flitted to and fro like the arms of an octopus, until at last they had caught a bomber. The British machine was flying at about 14,500 feet, 
and took no avoiding action. The gunners below made him their target, but they were shooting too far ahead. I decided to attack. Resop quickly transmitted the code word, Polke, Polke, to the ground station. I dived from my superior altitude and got the bomber in my sights. The airspeed indicator needle rose to 330 miles per hour. The bomber grew ever larger in the sights. Now I could clearly see the tall tail unit and the rear gunner's perspex turret. My machine came into the searchlight area, and a few well-aimed bursts lashed the bomber's fuselage, tearing off huge pieces of the fabric. The Tommy was on fire and turned over on its back. Everything happened in a flash. At incredible speed, I streaked past the burning British bomber and zoomed high into the sky to escape the threatening flak bursts. Good stuff, Herr Lieutenant. Good stuff, shouted Resop, and reported our first victory to the ground station. Wolfsburg, from Buzzard 10, a Vickers Wellington shot down. Congratulations, Herr Lieutenant. Carry on the good work, and perhaps we'll get another. A swift glance below. The Tommy had hit the deck and exploded. Fires had been caused among the harbour installations and were glowing scarlet in the glare of the searchlights. The other Britishers had seen their comrade go down in flames and lost their nerve in the fiery tempest over the city. The ground station reported the first return flights. Resop suddenly called out, There's one above us! I could only vaguely recognise the outlines of an enemy aircraft. What a miracle! We had spotted him without a searchlight, without radar and without direction. The bomber was flying at a fairly high speed on a northerly course. My nerves were on edge. I forced myself to be calm and pulled up my nose. Slowly the monster drew closer to forty, thirty, twenty yards. We must have looked very small and insignificant compared with this mighty barn door with its gigantic wings covering the sky. It's a four-engine, stammered Rissop. We haven't seen this type before. I was now flying close below the bomber and took a breather. The enemy machine continued northwest on its homeward course, presumably quite unaware of the pursuer below. But I made a great mistake. The Tommy had long since spotted me. This was the first time that the short Sterling four-engine bomber, carrying a ten-ton load, had appeared in the Ruhr zone. Our defence knew nothing of this type. Resop and I were therefore unaware that beneath the fuselage sat a gunner with two heavy machine guns to protect this weak spot. In blissful ignorance we continued to fly below him, watching the glowing exhaust pipes of the four radial engines. How shall we attack? asked Rissop. I thought for a second and decided that the best method would be from below, in order to let the bomber pass across my sights and then to give him a good burst in the fuselage. The most dangerous moment would be when I zoomed behind his tail and the propeller slipstream of his engine is caught my aircraft. I therefore had to aim vertically at his fuselage in order to put tail end Charlie out of Action. It's time to fire, said Rissop. Otherwise he'll spot us. Put your trust in God and wade in, Herr Lieutenant. Those were his last words. I throttled back, let the bomber forge ahead and put on top rudder. The protruding nose appeared in my sights. At the same moment our bursts crossed. As out of a watering can, the enemy's tracers bore down on me from all the guns, completely blinding me. My aircraft was caught in the slipstream and tossed about like a scrap of paper. It was impossible to aim. The broadside of my Messerschmitt 110 afforded the Sterling gunner an excellent target, and the bullets lashed my cockpit, fuselage and petrol tanks. In a fraction of a second, my machine was transformed into a flaming torch. Scores of gallons of petrol were alight, the flames were already licking the cockpit. A machine gun salvo grazed my left leg and tore away the bundle of recognition flares attached to my left calf. The cockpit roof was torn off by the weight of the explosion and flew away. At this moment of almost certain death, I cast a glance at Rissop. He had slumped forward, lifeless, over his radio. The machine gun burst had killed him. My hope of getting out of the burning machine as it fell vertically into the yawning depths was very slight. The appalling heat in this sea of flames almost made me lose consciousness. I felt no fear. With a desperate effort, I hoisted my wounded leg out of the cockpit, but centrifugal force was too strong and forced me back into the aircraft.
So I abandoned all hope of being saved and put my hands up to shield my eyes. After a dive of 9,000 feet, the aircraft exploded in the air and flung me out. As a burning torch, I hurtled through the air on my back. The cool night air lashed my face and revived me. Like a flash, the thought ran through my head. The parachute is on fire. The silk cords were still in the pack, protected from the greedy flames. I quickly put out the flames with both hands and tore off my flying boots and gloves. I got away with it. It was high time to open the parachute for the red fires below seemed to be approaching at a terrifying speed. The earth drew closer and closer. A sudden jerk stopped my breathtaking fall. The parachute opened. My joy was indescribable, but it was soon to be dampened. The parachute was torn and had bullet holes in it. My nerves were at breaking point, and yet somehow I pulled myself together. I was now terribly afraid. During the dive, I had hardly had time to realise things, for they went too fast. But now, in this leisurely descent, I saw myself lying at any moment with broken limbs on some street pavement. And yet the earth did not seem to draw any nearer. One of the sixteen lines was shot through and was fluttering in the wind. The parachute was on a slant in the air and threatened at any minute to Roman candle. That would have been the end. With my last strength, I tugged on the opposite lift webs and righted the canopy. During this last desperate action, I crashed heavily into the water of a fluted Mido and sank up to the neck in the mud. Again, my luck held. The bad effects of my clumsy landing were offset by the soft soil. The cold waiter completely revived me. I fired my revolver into the air for someone to come and rescue me. Some men hurried up and freed me from my tricky situation. Then I fainted. When, after some hours, I opened my eyes, a sister was bending over me with a smile. I was saved. Recovery The worst was over. The head doctor of the hospital allowed me to take my first walk along the corridors. Supported by the sister, I looked out onto the gardens. The blossoms on the trees and the bright flowers of spring gave me a new urge to live. Only the thought of my trusty radio operator, Rissop, cast a shadow on my joy. The CO told me that they had great difficulty in recovering Risop's body. The nose of the machine as it hit the ground like a torpedo had bored deep into the marshy ground and taken Risop down with it into the depths. The sister described what had happened since I had been brought into hospital. You worried us, Herr Lieutenant. At a 1.30 in the morning the telephone rang in my ward. A night fighter had been shot down and the pilot lay unconscious and badly wounded in a peasant house. You were soon brought here and our chief surgeon took you under his wing. Now we've patched you up, but you won't be able to fly again. Your eyes have suffered too much from the heat. Not until the burnt skin peeled from your face did the swelling go down. The doctor could then lift your eyelids and examine the skin below. One of the sisters wept for joy when he said that you would be able to see again. The sister's words aroused my deepest gratitude. After removing a host of splinters, the doctor managed to save my left leg, and I was able to walk again after two months. Despite second-degree burns, there was no trace of a scar on my face. Although I suffered a great deal of pain, my health improved day by day, and the new skin gradually replaced the old. Now I was climbing up towards life again and enjoying my convalescence. My thoughts turned to my squadron at Venlo, and to my comrades. Should I ever be able to fly again? The sister's words became a nightmare. At last I was discharged, my limbs still aching, and with a new face I set out on my leave for bad shashan. Our group medical officer, Dr. Seeker, examined my eyes and smiled. You've had a great stroke of luck, my dear Jonan, he said. You'll be able to fly again in a fortnight, but don't get spotted a second time, because you might not get out of it so well. My squadron commander gave me a new radio operator, Obergefreiter Ostreicher, a typical easy-going VNS who was never ruffled. Well, what do you know, Herr Lieutenant? he kept saying as we studied the fatal short sterling. Every evening I sat with the young crews, working out the best methods of attacking this new type of bomber. By day I flew my new operational machine, Dora, to get accustomed to her. My inhibitions soon vanished and I recovered my confidence in the machine. 
One warm summer evening in July 1942, the CEO, after a conference with the station medical officer, put me on operations as reserve in Berta sector. The fighter controller of this region, Oberlieutenant Nick Meyer, telephoned and wished me good luck on my first operation since the accident. My position in reserve gave me little hope of having a brisk encounter, and I had no expectations of meeting a Tommy that night. I was therefore slightly surprised when my VNS radio operator stumbled into my hut with the words, Herr Lieutenant, get ready. The enemy's on the way. The boys are already airborne. OK, I replied, imitating his Viennese accent. We'd better get a move on. I got dressed with quiet deliberation and made my necessary preparations. The raiders flew fairly high over our airfield in the direction of the Ruhr, dropping a few bombs on our installations by way of greeting. The fire engine was on the spot and a few insignificant fires were soon under control. The ops room was in an uproar. Various lines were engaged and each time the shooting down of a bomber was reported, there was a loud cheer. The CO was flying in Sector Berta, which lay nearest to our airfield. This sector had the greatest number of penetrations recorded, a magnificent fighter controller, and the most bombers shot down. This was once more the case that night. The old man, after his second victory, reported heavy damage to his wings and engine. His adjutant, Ober-Lieutenant Frank, took off immediately to relieve him. But the raiders had gone, and Frank had to wait for an hour over Berta for their return flight. This period of waiting was always very boring. Radio silence was imposed because the wireless operator had to be prepared to receive orders from below at any minute. Our adjutant was at last relieved from the monotony by the first return flights and, emulating his superior, shot down a further two bombers. In the meantime, Ostriker and I, as reserves in Dora, received orders to take off and engage the tail of the returning raiders, should Ober-Lieutenant Frank be put out of action. This precaution proved to be a wise one, for Frank had to make a premature landing owing to a damaged radio. Well, we're off again, I thought, as I climbed to 12,000 feet and this time without the flak. The nights are particularly bright in July. The northern lights proved fateful to the British. Out of 80 enemy bombers, 30 were brought down. Buzzard 10 from Berta, enemy aircraft at 12,000 feet, course 280. Fly on course 100. Two couriers are entering your sector. This was my message from Oberlieutenant Nick Meyer. I had a strange feeling as I heard these words. They reminded me of the night of 26th March over Duisburg. Buzzard 10 from Berta. Bank to port on course 280. Courier at your altitude. Give her full throttle. My thoughts quickly vanished at this call over the air and the exciting search for the quarry began. They must be a few stragglers which had either been hit or were trying to catch up their comrades. At that moment, Nick Meyer called me again and ordered me to slow down. I had already overshot the British machines. I throttled back and lowered the flaps to break my speed. Enemy aircraft at 12,000 feet on the same course, one mile to stern, fly at 200 miles per hour and keep your eyes open. Almost at stalling speed, I let the adversary approach, keeping my eyes on the bright horizon to the north. At last, I saw a small shadow ahead. I dived immediately and got below him. This time I was not going to let him spot me. Surprise is half the battle. Once I had sighted the enemy, I felt quite calm. I was in no hurry and I crept in closer and closer. The enemy bomber of Vickers Wellington was trundling wearily homewards. Nick Meyer reported that the second bomber was flying further to the north out of my sector. My operator chimed in at this moment. Herr Lieutenant, fire into his wings. I'm sorry for those poor fellows. I had little sympathy with them when I thought of my earlier experience and aimed the cross of my sights on the enemy's port engine. The distance decreased 150, 150 yards. The rear gunner fired a few bursts, but he could not aim properly because his pilot was taking avoiding action. The tracers flew across the sky like a necklace of broken beads. I stuck close on his tail and waited for a favourable moment. 
Now the bomber's wings were spread out against the northern sky as he went into a left-hand turn. At this moment I levelled my aircraft and let him fly into the crosswires of my sights. The left aileron appeared. I gave him a burst and his port engine was on fire. I had hit him and was waiting for the crew to bail out. But nothing happened. The fire appeared to have gone out. The pilot had probably cut out his port engine and was trying to get away on one. I must make another attack then. I had to lower my wing flaps to keep his speed. The Britisher seemed to be a wily old fox and tried to shake me off by stalling. Now I was hanging like a limp feather in the sky. Each of us was trying to fly even slower. I grew impatient and rashly attacked direct from the rear. The rear gunner was waiting for me to approach, and as we drew closer my two cannon and four machine guns were pointed at his heavy machine guns. We opened fire at the same moment, and as the burning bomber dived earthwards, I noticed that my own plane had been hit. There was a smell of burning in the cockpit, but I could not see any flames. Suddenly my elevator jammed, and I dived steeply. It was a nasty situation. I let fly a juicy oath, and my Viennese must have taken this as an alarm signal for when, after a 3,000-foot dive, my stick functioned once more, and I had the machine in control. A current of air blew through the cockpit. I looked behind, but my radio operator had bailed out, and his seat was empty. This was no great surprise. He had apparently found our dive a bit too hot and bailed out on the principle that it was better to be alive hanging on a parachute than dead in the machine. Now that I had no radio, any further combat was out of the question. Without radio bearings or positional reports from the ground, I had to rely on my own instinct to bring my Dora safely home. My only hope was Nick Meyer. He would probably have noticed that something was wrong and have notified the surroundings airfields. After a quarter of an hour's flight between the Rhine and the Maas, I saw flares, radishes, as we called them, being fired in the distance. In the meantime, Papa Hitgen had done everything in his power to lighten my task of finding the airfield. I finally landed, happy but sweating profusely, in the early morning hours at Venlo. I was received with shouts of joy by my friends, who informed me that my Viennese had landed safely and reported my crash and his own rescue. When we next met, he naively said to me, well, sir, when you went into that power dive, you swore so terribly that I thought, we've had it, and I took a quick powder. Without even saying goodbye, I replied. Hmm, Herr Lieutenant, I was in a hurry, you know, but I'm glad to see you're still alive. The landslide begins. So far, the British night raids had caused comparatively little damage. The German armament industry was still working at full blast, and supplies were reaching the front line without interruption. The daily special communiques on the successes of the Wehrmacht allowed us to hope for an early final victory. Deep in enemy territory, the German soldier was fighting with incomparable idealism and rolling the enemy ever further back to the gates of Moscow and Cairo. But the lines of communication grew longer, and the occupied territories could only be lightly held. The home front worked like beavers to supply the soldiers at the front and to show them that they were not fighting on their own. The frontline soldiers believed that their dear ones were safe at home, and this gave them courage. However, of what use is courage in the long run against superior forces? As a result of Hitler's declaration of war on America in December 1941, the British now had a new and powerful ally. The British Isles experienced an American invasion such as had never before been seen. Aircraft, tanks, ships, guns, trucks, ammunition, medical supplies and transports full of soldiers arrived in the English West Coast harbours despite the great U-boat activity in the Atlantic. Airfields with mile-long runways sprang up like mushrooms. America's war production went into top gear and her endless reserves were poured into the battle. The American tempo determined the strategic raids on Germany. Where runways were lacking, the Americans simply laid heavy, closely woven steel matting across meadows and fields. The same day, American fighters, Thunderbolts, Mustangs and Lightnings 
took off from these temporary airfields, giving air cover to heavy bombers raiding the center of Germany. The British flew by night and the Americans by day, a non-stop service. Impossible flying weather alone halted for a brief instant the offensive against the German home front. The German fighter arm could not compete with this mass attack. In feverish haste, new squadrons were formed, but of what use were young, inexperienced pilots in night fighting? Many of them fell out of the sky without ever having seen an enemy, and yet the few squadrons fought bravely. The outward and return flights of the enemy were marked by the wrecks of burning aircraft. The British suffered serious losses, but the gaps in their ranks were soon filled. Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans and Americans reinforced the bomber groups. Each night, death spread its wings over another German city. Each morning brought tears of despair and terror of the approaching night. The night fighter crews could no longer think of sleep, for the enemy often came twice in one night. After the first mission, we landed on some airfield, refuelled and took off once more against the enemy. Operations lasted from four to six hours. In the early morning, the exhausted crews fell into their bunks and slept until the Americans arrived in their silver birds. Alert, the night fighters also had to take part in the daylight defence. Hardly had they slept a few hours to rest their nerves after the excitement of the night than the air raid sirens roused them and they scrambled for their aircraft. The unequal struggle began, the American fast fighters against the slow, clumsy German night fighters. The air throbbed with the drone of engines from bombers flying in close formation. Scores of fast fighters watched over their heavy charges, which flew on their course without deviation. As soon as the first German fighters appeared, they dived on the enemy, and within a few seconds a dogfight was in progress. In this mad chaos, the night fighter squadrons, in close formation, tried to approach the bombers. The gunners had the difficult task of keeping off the constant attacks of American fighters. It was a disastrous melee. Friend and foe hurtled in flames out of the sky, until in the late afternoon, the American bomber stream turned on its course for home. Losses on both sides were appalling. Many of our night fighter pilots, who so far had fought magnificently in the darkness, now fell in daylight combats. Until dusk, we had a few hours rest and relaxation, and then the performance began again. Our Night Fighter Wing No one in Venlo fought magnificently. Hauptmann Streib, Oberlieutenants Thimig, Frank, Knacker, Wandam, Grieser and Luz were the wing aces. Night and day, in bitter air battles, Knacker engaged one Britisher after the other and won the Knight's Cross. Despite the British air supremacy, the crews and the ground staff continued to carry out their duties with enthusiasm. The comradeship between officers and crews and between the flying and the ground staff was magnificent. Each man who had been home on leave and experienced the night bombing carried out his duty more fanatically and conscientiously than ever, and yet the gaping wounds no longer healed. Cities were pulverised and the bombing warfare gradually undermined the resistance of the people. Everything that men held dear went up in flames. Huge expanses of a city were often erased in a single night. Century-old buildings with priceless collections, castles, churches, schools, factories, private houses and stations disintegrated. The monstrous juggernaut of fire sucked the terrified people into its wake and consumed them. The cities of Munster, Karlsruhe and Essen suffered grievously in the summer of 1942 from concentrated bombing attacks. On his return from leave in Karlsruhe, one of my comrades gave his own account of the Thur September raid. At 02.10 hours the sirens wailed. Very few of the townspeople stumbled out of their warm beds and sought the protection of the air raid shelters. What was the good? In comparison with the big industrial cities, Karlsruhe was unimportant, and the British would at the most be making a feint for a nuisance attack. But suddenly even the most cool-headed citizen felt anxious as a deafening roar of engines made the air above this old residence town quiver. The Tommies are over the city, ran the alarm cry through the streets and houses. The first bombs exploded in the centre of the city, causing a panic among the population. Everyone rushed in despair to the air raid shelters, 
and the wardens had the greatest difficulty in keeping order. Our flak gunners fired like maniacs into the night sky, without inflicting any serious damage on the bombers. Street after street went up in flames. Tears welled in the eyes of the citizens the following morning when they saw the tragic damage. The first doubts as to our war leadership began to rise, and many people lost their faith in the Hitler regime. Wild rumours ran round the city. I think, my friend who had returned from leave, said at the end of his shattering report, that the enemy has achieved his first objective, to destroy the morale of the home front. How was this overwhelming attack by the Allied air forces to be halted? The problem remained unchanged, the discovery of the enemy by night. Out of the thousand oncoming bombers, flying in close formation through the sectors covered by individual night fighter squadrons, only a fraction were caught in the searchlight beams, and of these only a few were shot down by fighters. The majority of the bombers flew undetected on the outward and return journey from England over Holland and Belgium to Germany. The night fighter arm was too closely bound to the individual sectors and too limited in its radius of action. The British, by means of their secret service, had soon discovered the danger sectors and knew the weak spots in our defence from the reports of their own crews. What was the result? The Allied squadrons started from every airfield in England, assembled over a certain beacon in the North Sea, and then flew at short intervals, almost goose-stepping towards the weakest night fighter areas. Then they crashed by sheer weight through this area like a broad stream driven through a narrow channel. Our whole night defence was crippled by these approach tactics, since the broad zone of defence stretching from Paris over Flensburg was useless. It had to become more elastic. But how? As long as the night fighter pilot had to rely on a machine being caught in the searchlights and could not find his opponent by his own efforts, he was virtually helpless. The morale of the crews, which cruised around at night, unable to interfere while the Britishers broke through en masse perhaps twenty miles away, sank to zero. And then at last came salvation. Berlin sent us the first night fighter machines equipped with their own radar and moreover with an unlimited radius of action. Feverishly, the electro-engineers had developed an apparatus which sent out electric beams on ultra-short waves into space. The path of the beam from transmitter to a metal object and back to the receiver took a fraction of a second, was measured by the apparatus and evaluated visibly on cathode ray tubes. This miracle machine aroused great excitement throughout the whole night fighter arm. Rumours were rife and many people believed that machines would eventually be put into service equipped with death rays. This rumour was not so wild as it appears, for although the Liechtenstein apparatus, it was known as Lee in night fighter circles, did not send out death rays, it seized the opponent with invisible arms and drew him towards itself as an octopus catches its prey. The death blow from the night fighter's cannon followed.